Hello, you guys, and welcome to Real Estate Divas. Today, we are gonna be talking about the basics of wholesaling. That one's a huge topic that everybody's always talking about, um, but the basics really need to be broken down. So today, we're gonna to just walk you through that process right after this. Hi there and welcome back to Real Estate Divas. We are going to be talking about the basics of wholesaling today with my lovely co-host, Kristen Gerst. And uh, I love wholesaling. Yeah. Well, I enjoy it. I don't love it. Well, I don't do it anymore, but it definitely <laughs> has its place. It does. It has its place. I was really glad when it kind of took off. I know a lot of real estate agents out there were we're like, this is illegal. We shouldn't be doing this. You know, um, don't, don't talk to are, the Are you sellers. talking about the ones that are like on MLS already? Yeah. Oh, that's making a and resurgence. I was like, but also just that they thought wholesalers were taking their jobs away. And I was like, um, wholesalers are doing a service that you are never, ever, ever going to do. So whenever it became a big thing where people were, we get, we're on wholesale lists. We know what wholesalers we want to deal with. Um, I'm getting that dropped in my inbox and I don't have to solicit it out and I don't have to spend the money on marketing and I don't have to show up at somebody's house at 11 o'clock at night. I am all for somebody else <laughs> doing the wholesaling. <laughs> I like to buy from the wholesaler. Uh, yeah, and it is. It is a service and that there is a place for it and there are a lot of people who don't want to spend the time going through and i mean let's talk about the old school you know we're going to talk about old school leads and how to find these things but this is one of those number one questions when you know newbie real estate investors are trying to break in they don't have any money wholesaling is a great way to get started it is a great launching pad for getting into real estate because it can launch you and give you that that cash injection that you need to stay in real estate but further than that it also teaches you to negotiate yep. for property. It, te it teaches you how to pay the correct price for property because knowing that you know, you're buying it even less than what somebody will pay you for means that, all right, this is a really good deal. And you know, it's a great way to you know, get educated and be a very Absolutely. strong real estate investor. Well, because that's typically, I mean, like you and I know, a lot of people start in wholesaling and then they migrate into something else because they realize you start learning what everybody's doing with your wholesales that you're offering out. And you're like, wow, this is, this is a real career, you know, and it helps you educate yourself along the way. Or you're me, you know, who had like 61 rental doors, you know, and I was already property managing for years and then the market fell out in 08. And then I was like, well, you know, I'm toxic on paper. Nobody's going to give me money. So yeah. I learned how to wholesale. So you went, you went backwards. I went backwards. Way. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. well, I wholesale can't. And then, but you learned how to wholesale when things, wholesaling wasn't really a thing prior to that. No. You know, people weren't out there doing it. it, it that, I mean, that really is like a market crash thing. And then shortly thereafter, then you start hearing people talk about it, talk about it, talk right. about it. Right. Yeah. So it is fairly, as far as real estate goes, it is kind of a newer strategy. Yes. So jumping right in, the number one important thing to know when you are going to wholesale is what is that property worth when it is in perfect condition and you are going to buy that for 70% minus repairs. Or but that was traditionally what you were supposed that, to do. Yeah, traditionally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with this last two years, obviously, there's been a lot of, I mean, and really and truly, that's what the investor who was going to flip it wanted to buy for. So wholesalers even go lower, Even below. Like they're buying below. at 60 or 65% of ARV after repair value minus the repairs needed. And that's what they were paying for that property. And I got to tell you back in... 2008, 2009, 2010. I was doing that all day long. Yeah. And people were selling at that. And then and then Dallas got popular. 
<laughs> well, and then the nation kind of got popular, so there's that. We uh, we ended up with the with the whole real estate boom, and it's starting to soften now. We're starting to see a difference, but we won't get into that just yet. We're going to go down our list. So seventy percent minus repairs. Again, other people will pay seventy five, eighty. It depends on the market. It really does. It depends on the market. We, we've experienced that over the last year, but um, you, you want to be more conservative. I mean, at least launch off into that most conservative place, and you can always work your way up. Yeah. So sue for 70%. It, it, at, the, at the very minimum, well, it, now that things are softening, shoot for lower. And, and we're not going to dive in on how to pull comps and do a good job on pulling comps in this episode. Yeah, that's another episode. It's another episode. But, you know, be conservative in your values. Don't go, oh, wow, I can push this thing, you know, $50,000. The tippity top but, of the market value. No, you're, you're looking at averages. Even below averages is really what you're looking at. Because you don't want to get caught, especially when you go to present it to your buyers and then tear apart your comps and go, well, this is just not even worth it. Yep. This is not a 70% of ARV deal. You know, it's more like a 90% of ARV, or ARV deal. So like we've seen for the last year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I had I had some that came across my desk, I don't know, yesterday, and they started in the title rental. <laughs> uh, okay. Every time I hear that, it's like either it's a great flip. When it says great rental property, I'm like, okay, well, they're selling this at like 90 to 100%. Well, and on the flip side of that, I have been dealing with, you know, we're dealing with a little bit of a softening in our market. I am getting offers on listings that they're coming in, I mean, rock bottom. Are they really? $70,000 under asking. And we're second day on the market. <laughs> and I'm just looking at these offers going, what? <laughs> what are you doing here? Like, that we are not there yet. Sorry, tap the brakes. Okay, so we, we can't lowball offers yet. Is no, that what you're I, yeah, well, especially not on the MLS. Come on, people, let's go. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you find deals? People, this is a constant. How do you find deals? If I'm a wholesaler, how do I find deals? Yes. I'm asked that question weekly. Yeah. How do you find your deals? How do, how do I get started in this? How do I do it? Um, I would go old school. Yeah, which is the cheapest way. Yeah, and it's you're you're going to be out there, and when you're first starting, you're going to feel like you're you're swimming, you know, in this never-ending sea, abyss, yeah. and you're looking for, you know, this one tiny fish, and you know, you're never going to find it. They're out there. They're out there everywhere. Well, and I think that's what people don't understand is that, especially when you're new, you do feel like it's the needle in the haystack. But really, it is. There are a plethora of people out there that are in need of it for whatever reason. Everybody has different reasons. But one of the cheapest ways to go about it is the driving for dollars. You can buy an app. You can, you know, do all of these things that will, uh, what is it? Uh, Just make it easier. Make it easier and help you track. But you could just drive around with a map and go, all right, this address or what, a notepad. And, and what you're looking for is that eyesore on the street. Anybody who's not taking care of their house, any houses that are boarded up, any, you know, are there, is there trash? Are they keeping the lawn mode? Yep. Like you said, the newspapers piling up. That right there, that usually tells me, okay, this person doesn't live here, you know. Those kind of things, any neglect that you see that is not, like you'll drive through neighborhoods and you, it looks like the whole neighborhood is neglected, but that's not what you're looking for. That's what the neighborhood looks like. What you're looking for is you're looking for something that sticks out, something that is not like the other. And you know? I guarantee there's at least one in every neighborhood, usually almost one per block. Yep. And you will just drive around and you'll see it. And when you do, you write down that address and you can do the rest of your work at home. Pretty much. And Pretty much. you're right. There are services that you can pay money for that will send a postcard to it right away. You know, you just click a button. And then it's out. But you, there are, you know, that's one of the appeals of wholesaling. And the reason it got popular as quickly as it did is people could get in to wholesaling with very little money. You spend a lot of time, but very little money. 
Um, so that that is there, but if your time means more to you than than money does, you know, not that money's not important, but you have a little bit of cash to spend, then you'll want to use these tools because it's just going to make you more efficient. That's the word I was looking for. Efficient. More efficient. <laughs> efficient. And, and efficiency is good, you know, yeah. and it's going to depend on the person. Everything as a real estate investor boils down to do I have enough time or do I have enough money? Yeah. And what do you want more of? And if you have more money than time, I guarantee you're going to start paying for more of these services, services just absolutely. to be more efficient and get it done faster. Well, you, because then you want to hit as many people as possible. You're trying to get it out there. How many deals can I get? You know, versus I'm just looking for that one. I just so see one. Driving for dollars. How many? How many houses have you personally bought doing that? Driving for dollars, not a lot, because I've. N raising a family and working, yeah, not a lot of time. Uh, my daughter and I, we did driving for dollars there for a while, um, but I picked up two houses that way. Now I've actually found houses for other people that way. Really? That I didn't pick up. But oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure you did well, a lot of those. Yeah. Uh, some, of the, some of my best deals I did. I mean, you know, I've done six. Six where I was like, oh, wow. You know, especially if I'm, rehabbing a house a few doors down yeah then i'm like well, that I'm makes it pretty here. easy it does yeah because you're already there and you're going to be there on a regular anyway right and i've also clued other investors in especially if you're rehabbing a house like i, I remember one time i was doing a fourplex and i started calling up a few in, like big investors that i knew and i said hey it's a gold mine over here these places are boarded up you know because i wanted my fourplex to go way up in value which meant you basically had to rehab the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just a great way word of mouth, but um, next bandit signs. Oh, did you have another point? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I know just from like we were talking about the uh, firehouse that I'm dealing with right now, but just being over at the firehouse a lot in the last couple of weeks, I can't tell you how many people walk up to me while I'm standing there going, Hey, are you, are you ready to sell? Are you ready to sell? Nope. But, Kudos to them. They're out there. They're man, looking there, for people. Man, are there that many wholesalers out there? Because you know, there. I it's a I special am not investor even joking. to do a burnout. I am not even joking. I've had at least half a dozen come up wow. to me while I've been on the property. I mean, I can't tell you how many have texted me, but that's a, that's one of the other processes that right. we'll be talking about. Right. So bandit signs. Bandit signs. Bandit uh, signs work. They really do. They work. Now, you, what you do need to uh, look at when you're doing bandit signs, and for those of you who don't know what bandit signs are, bandit signs are uh, just basically, you've seen them on the side of the highway, on at intersections, we buy houses. I buy ugly houses. You know, give me your disaster house, your hoarder house, whatever, and there's a phone number. Now, there are a lot of zoning issues, and so you need to make sure, and you have this experience. I've heard your story. Um, <laughs> but you need to check with your local zoning oh, in God. order to figure out whether or not your signs are going to get picked up because those signs cost money. By the way, they all, it's, it's a violation anywhere you're at. So the key is to be invisible when you're putting out these signs. You don't do it at three or four o'clock in the afternoon like this idiot did. Uh, at rush hour? At rush hour. Rush hour's not Where good. I was arrested <laughs> by the dog catcher and then had to play dumb blonde. No, these, no, these aren't my signs. That's not my phone number. I yeah. had no idea where this came from. Yeah. But I almost had like a $40,000 fine because that dog catcher was like, we have been looking for you for months. We've got, however many it was, they were like, we have... We have a couple hundred of your signs. Google phone. In our, yeah. And yeah. I had a Google phone number on it. So make sure your phone number is untraceable yeah. if you're doing this. I, we are not attorneys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put Obviously, that out there. You know, this just, is how you break the law and you don't get caught. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's good anyway, just because you don't want people having your personal information and stuff like that. Just random people. I mean, think of putting your... I put it's a, like putting your phone number I, on a bathroom wall or something. It is. And yeah. then if you're out there doing it, I had one very classy gentleman apparently watching me put this sign up. Mm -hmm. And I had one of those big poles with the stapler in it. Yeah. So you would go and you would yeah, like, like staple it in, but yeah. way up high so that nobody could just rip it down easily. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I get a call on my cell phone and it's like, 
um, hi, your number was in my phone, but uh, I'm not sure how I know you. And I'm like, okay. You know, and he's like, do you work at Stilettos? And I'm like, nope. no. <laughs> and then, of course, then I'm looking around. I'm like, okay, I got to wait until the yeah. crazies are yeah. not around. Like, the, you want to do it early, early, early in the morning or something when it's not. I used to do it like four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I'd get up, I'd get my coffee, I'd go drive around, and I'd put out signs. Yeah. So don't use your personal phone number and, don't you know, name. and maybe <laughs> just uh, don't do it in the light of day. <laughs> um, but they really do work. They and do work. And also, if you bought a house in that neighborhood or you know somebody in that neighborhood, you, I'm sure you can get their permission to put a sign in their yard. That's perfectly legal, you know? Yeah, so you, you can, can, anything that's your property, you can stick a sign in. Another one uh, that uh, kind of goes along with the bandit signs is the, uh, what is it, Daniel used to do them. I love them. Yeah. The, the car decal. Yeah, the car decal. You put it in the back window or something like that. And there was a specific number related to each car that it was on. And if you got a lead that was, if your car, got a lead that actually came to fruition with a house, a purchase or some a wholesale deal, then you got 150 bucks just for having the decal on the back of your car. Um, and those prices changed. But didn't he have a car that was broken down somewhere? Yeah, just parked. It was like parked in a lot and had been for a while and he got a lead off of it. Yep. So, uh, yeah, no, I think it's... That was brilliant. I mean, he got like a lot. He got a lot well, of leads. Well, you know, and I would never put that on my car. I don't want to have we yeah. buy houses on my car. But yeah. But again, you know, when you're starting out, great way because you're driving around. We buy houses. Yep. And your phone number, and it's not illegal. Yep. So then it's a mailing list and postcards. Like you mentioned, there are several services out there. And they're so not all good. They're not all good. But you do, you can just, you know, go ahead and write them yourself. That's really time consuming. But if you don't have money, that's a good way to do it. So when you're buying these lists, ask when this list was updated, how often their list is updated. I'm still getting mail from stuff from Hartford, from that condo you sold for me. Mm. What, like almost a year ago? I just got a card on it two days ago. Yep. So again, you need to ask, hey, when, where is this list? When's this list been generated? Because I know I'm off tax rolls. Well, I will say, so that's two separate things. Like, if, are you mailing properties that you actually feel like you've seen or you've done your driving for dollars or just you're blanketing one neighborhood? Are you coming up with the list or are you purchasing a list? Because like you said, there are people out there that sell lists. that are supposed to be stacked lists of people that are out of state, investment properties, or that are deteriorated. They're, they've got their water was cut off. Like there's all these different lists that you can buy that are stacked with data so that you know the probability of somebody selling. But you need to make sure you're, you're buying a list from a viable source. Yeah. And you know, and all of that costs money. So yep. if you are going to be doing that, try and I don't know how you, I mean, talk to you people. Gotta, I mean, <laughs> that right there comes down to the number one thing you got to do in real estate, which is networking. So and networking. Go, hey, who do you use? Who have you gotten a great Sometimes response Sometimes you from? get, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you might get the right source from them, but for the most part, you know, if you've got a community of network or a networking community um, that's worth any weight, then they'll they'll share some of those some of those gems and some of those services. All right. So next one, public records, city liens. All of this is available on your laptop. You just have to kind of do dive in and find out where these are, and they're going to give a property address for whatever city mowing liens, water liens, any of that. And the real gold is, you know, out of state landlords who are now getting saddled with liens from the city and they might not want this headache anymore. Well, liens from the city that they can't dispute, they can't do anything but pay. And then now they've got to find somebody to fix whatever they're getting liens put on their property for or getting fined for. So out of state owners are kind of a gold mine. 
You know, I mean, that's that's who you want to kind of target is the or one of the bigger ones you want to target besides the probate and the and the foreclosure and all of that business. Yeah, out of state. I mean, I love out of state owners, mm -hmm. and that's typically you're going to find that there's so many out of state investors who are like, yes, you know, especially. 10 years ago because property was so cheap Yeah, in Texas. They're like, all right, let's go. We're going to buy property in Texas. And then they get into it and they're like, okay, this is harder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. That's kind of a pain. This is a real job. This is, a real I don't know. <laughs> this is kind of a real job. <laughs> so the speaking of probate though, probate and divorce leads are a gold mine um, that you would get from attorneys, obviously, your probate and divorce attorneys. So I bought, speaking of lists that aren't good, be very careful with your email blast lists. So I got, I bought a list of Texas attorneys. Oh yeah? Email addresses, with mm -hmm. specific their email addresses. And I didn't really look at all of the columns that were available. One of them was birth date. And had I read the birth date column, uh, I would have realized some of these attorneys are over uh, like 95, 100 years They're no old. longer practicing they, attorneys. They probably, I'm like, if they were a good attorney, they haven't been practicing for 20 or 25 years. Yeah, at least. What the heck is up with this list? Yeah. And that was, I mean, it was a good portion. So, wow. and again, when you're putting it into your email, like your constant contact or your MailChimp or something like that, it's really gonna screw with well you'll get, and I mean, you'll get with attorneys pretty the, fast. well the other thing is like with attorneys that one's kind of that's a little you know um that's a little risky in my mind because if they're on a do not contact if they're on some sort of list or they didn't sign up for your list right. or something like that right and because even with some of our email blasts that we do for recruiting We've gotten a few where people have re responded with, take me off your spam list. And I'm like, it's not spam. You're a realtor. <laughs> and I'm saying, do you want to move? Do you want to come to my brokerage? Like, how is that spam? But, you know, I mean, I get it. They didn't sign up for it. Right. Yeah. But again, then they didn't know that they wanted <laughs> right. to be a part of you gotta my be presented email with the opportunity. List. Yeah. I'm like, how can I spam you and give you new information <laughs> about all the wonderful things that I am without, yeah. you know, without it? I, I get it. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah. So divorce attorneys and probate attorneys are definitely. And, and we've, and I love, I love this type of lead because very few people are going after it. I think now with the rise of networking events, Attorneys have their own networking events. And so you can go in there, meet these people, you know, yep. have a drink with them and go, yep. hey, this is what I offer. When when you've got a client, they need to sell their house. I've got I've got five different options. I can buy it, I can sell it really quick to somebody else, I can put it up for retail. I mean you've got a And for me, yeah. mortgage notes. Yeah. Um, so I actually do have a couple of attorneys now from my, you know, from my spam list of yep. like you know, the, the, the geriatrics, the 100, 110. <laughs> yeah. We're burned the 1920s, <laughs> you know. Um, I actually did get a couple leads off of that. I also did have to change from MailChimps to constant contact because that didn't that work was, out so well. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other way would be, um, which is also a public list, it's just sometimes a little bit harder to get if you're trying to get it on your own, is the pre-foreclosure and foreclosure lists. Those are a little harder just because our, our government systems are so antiquated that getting online is not, you can't just get online and look that stuff up. You actually have to go to the courthouse most of the time to get Depending that information. On your Depending, yeah. But most of the time, you're going to have to go to the courthouse. Um, not every time, but it's that our government has not updated their systems. But there, there, there are services. You there are services. Too. There are services. So you can buy these lists. There's I've several never people. I used to buy the Roddy list oh, back yeah. back yeah, yeah, in the day, yeah, yeah. but you had to pay for each individual county was a certain dollar amount, and each month it, you paid for it again. 
So you could be buying for all of DFW. Well, how many counties do we have here? You know, you got four relative counties right here. You make that mistake so, once. Yeah. Because that's fine. You buy that's for four. That's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's also, it used to be quite a lot of money. Now you can find them from other sources and Propelio is one of them. If you sign up for Propelio, they still do a lead list for the DFW area. And it's all pre-foreclosures? Pre for well, it's several. It's pre foreclosure, foreclosure, probate, and notice of airship. What's notice of airship? That's basically it's about to go into probate. Okay, so that's before. Yeah, so it's you're in just, probate. We're they're letting you know. Okay, it's out there. This is probably a property that will get put up for sale. Why would you wait on the notice of airship list as opposed to just going for probate? Do you, you, would want, you would really want to go for both. You'd want to go for both, but yeah. you'd want to try to get it before it goes into probate. Yes. Because I have to imagine. That's a time-consuming process. Right. You know, but uh, some of the best deals can be time-consuming. So, yeah. I'm so not there are list services out there that you can go and you can either purchase or if you're really diligent and you, you've got more time, you can go out there and do it your, on your own. Great. Yeah. All right, so determining value, yeah. Click, just just let them know how to do it because, you know. Well, determining value, really what you want to do is network and partner with an agent because typically that's going to be your best go-to as far as determining what the price of that property is. But don't be a jerky investor yeah. and abuse your agent. I mean, if you send somebody, you know, sending somebody one address and going, hey, can you give me a value on this? is a lot different than sending them a list of like 50. Yeah. Those those are new investors. Those are never those are never the investors that uh, are seasoned whatsoever. So the new investors tend to kind of abuse their realtor relationships. But those uh, but realtors need to know that if you're if you're working with investors, you're going to be a little bit at their beck and call. You they are going to need some information from you pretty quickly when it comes to comps, especially if it's a wholesale deal. But there again, there are services out there where you can pull your own comps. Not every state, you know, we live in Texas, which is a non-disclosure state which means we don't publicly put out our sold data. You have to have an agent in order to get that data. Or you or, can do Propelio. Or you can get on Propelio. I and, pay my $89 a month. Yep. So I don't abuse you. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Propelio, it allows you to put in your search criteria and you can uh, you can pull the comps for that property. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we use it at Capricorn. Yep. Like I use it daily probably to figure figure out the value of things. But when we're looking at it, you know, you have to know, go apples to apples. If it's a three bedroom, two bath, you know, you don't get to go compare say it compared to, to, a to a four three or a, a five three or, or even a three one. Bathrooms are important. So, you know, you want they definitely need to be uh, apples to apples. You definitely need to uh, be comparing a brick home with a brick home, not not a wood siding home. You don't want to cross major highways or major streets, like the busy streets. You don't want to do that. You typically want to stay in the same school zone. School zones are really important for the sale of the house. It could be just across the street or two blocks down, look exactly the same as far as the home's concerned, but if they go to two different schools, that could be a, that could be especially elementary schools. Yeah, that could end up being a hundred thousand dollar difference in in prices. I, I know of several neighborhoods, neighborhoods like that. Like that. Yep. Um, but also, yeah, property age, square foot, mm -hmm. square footage. And so, really, if you're staying inside that neighborhood, typically they're not going to vary that drastically. Much. But the one that I love is the wholesaler always comes up with the house that's like fifteen hundred or two thousand square feet larger, right? It's 3,600 square feet. And this thing is, you know, everything is typically 1,500. Mm -hmm. They put some monstrosity of a, an addition on it. And, and they're, they're trying to get the same price per square foot. And yeah, you can't not, do that. It doesn't that. work that way. So yeah, you want to work on price per square foot, but then also look at your ceiling. Mm -hmm. wh wh what's the highest thing? That Where does it sold? top out? 
you know, the top out, uh, every neighborhood has a ceiling. Every neighborhood tops out somewhere. And sometimes that's not the biggest home, but there, there is a ceiling as to how much the general public's willing to spend in that neighborhood. So, and, and just, a, just a tip before we go to break really fast. Mm -hmm. Investors, if you're looking for something to flip, flip the smallest house in the neighborhood. Stay that away is, from the biggest yeah, house. Stay, stay away from the biggest. You'll get the most bang for your buck. One, it won't cost you as much to rehab, rehab it. And two, you'll get the highest price per square foot. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a win-win. So yeah, tip of the day. Don't ever do those big tip houses. Tip of the day. Tip of the day. Don't do those big <laughs> houses. Um, so let's uh, cut to break and we'll be right back after this. Awesome. All right, we're back. <laughs> Welcome back to Real Estate Divas. We are breaking it down step by step how to do wholesaling basics. So we've gone through what, one through four one and through three. one through three, and we're on <laughs> three. Well, Number four, estimating rehabs. Wow, do wholesalers have a problem with this? Yeah. And I get it. They're brand new to real estate. They've never rehabbed anything. They don't know what anything costs. Guess what? It costs a lot. It is not $5 a square foot. Well, and <laughs> one of those things, like more often than not, I see it's just lipstick or it's a it, minor rehab, $30,000, $35,000. That seems to be everybody's go-to number is thirty dollars to $35,000. I'm like, what is going on here? Do you even know what's wrong with this house? No. Yeah. No. And really, they haven't had to. Well, and they haven't yeah. had to care over the last couple of years. But times, they are changing. That's true. And real estate is cyclical. And once we get into a tougher market, you're going to need to know your rehab numbers. Absolutely. At least get close. Find out what it costs to rehab something. Well, you and I did a whole show on how how to come up with those numbers, right? Yeah. So we did where you're, where you go to Home Depot. Uh, can you just give me, this is the square footage. This is the product I want to use. What would you charge me to put it in? And you give them kind of the scope of work. That's going to give you a real idea. You do that a few times, you'll be able to walk into a property and have a real handle on what that rehab budget should be. You can also Google. There's that. What, what zip code is it in? and say, what, what's the cost for rehabs in this zip code? And again, it'll give you a ballpark estimate. Compare that with what you get at Home Depot. And again, you're going to get a, a round and number. When I was doing tons of wholesale deals, so this is after, after everything crashed in 08, and we were going out, I was looking at 40 or 50 foreclosure homes, you know, a week. Yep. And it was just, I mean, it was a crazy, crazy work schedule. So I would go in, you know, I'm driving all over the place. So yeah. I would walk in with my clipboard and I'm like, yep, needs bathrooms, boom, boom. It needs kitchen, you know, basic how, you know, and I'd quickly look, what's the size of the kitchen? Is it a 10 by 10, you know, or is it a 15 by 20? I mean, yep. there's kitchen sizes of all. So, you know, I'd look at the size of the kitchen and look at the size of the bathrooms I look at bedrooms, I look at square footage. What's it need outside? Does it need a roof? Does it need HVAC? Well, and you know, I mean, wholesalers uh, typically, they don't need to know, they don't need it to be exact. They need a ballpark, so, but at least get in the ballpark, right. you know? I mean, $35,000 when in actuality, it's more of a $70,000 rehab and you're pricing it to where they'll be out, you know, whoever the end buyer is, is gonna be out money and can't actually sell it and get all their money back out, then you're just not, you're not in the ballpark, you right. know? So really we're trying to tell you, just do a little bit of due diligence and so you can get in that Right, and, and again, I, you know, I had it all set down, but if you're dealing with a master bathroom that's five feet by four feet, which, you know, those exist, they're these tiny little master baths, Compared to an enormous master bath, yep. you know, the difference could be $5,000 to $20,000 to rehab this yep. bathroom and to put everything new in. So you've got to look at your square footage, especially in bathrooms and kitchens. Yes. And then, and then flooring and square and footage. Don't and don't abuse your contractors. If you've got one that you're working with, that's great. But 
don't abuse it. You know, they do not need to come out to every single offer, especially whenever you're going to 15 a week. You know, they don't need to see every, you snap some pictures, do the square footage, write down the details. They can usually do it off of that. Um, and give you a ballpark. And give you a ballpark so that you're actually putting it out there at a reasonable price. And, and there are estimator tools mm -hmm. out there that you can pay for. That you can pay or for. Or you can create your own, you know, just by doing a few of them. It does get to be repetition. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. No. And you do. You have to be in the ballpark. Yep. But ballpark. at least try and be in the ballpark. Well, and then making an offer. You want to view that property before making an offer because so often whenever you're putting those mailers out there or somebody's calling off a bandit sign or something like that they have an idea of what they want for that property you may pull up that property you may google maps that property and go oh, that doesn't look so bad yeah that number sounds sounds about right but you need to inspect that property hands down before ever making that offer as a homeowner, as a seller, if I'm getting a blind offer on something, I'm either going to think, oh my gosh, I didn't ask enough, or this person's taking advantage of me. Yep. And the other thing, bring the contract with you. I love that one. Yeah. Well, the contract, I mean, right there, if this is a deal, if I want to put this, this contract, I want to seal this down, I want to represent it, I want to make the money on this property, why would I then leave the house and go, I'll email you, give them five more minutes to double check and then go, oh, maybe I should call somebody else. Or maybe I saw that number at three o'clock in the morning on the, on some paper TV ad and I'll call them and see what they'll offer me. And then all of a sudden you're squeezed out of the deal. And I know some really successful wholesalers and one of them has a tactic that he uses he brings a checkbook with him. I love that one. Dan does that. I love that one. I think one. it's brilliant. I mean, yeah. even if it's like you're writing $1,000 to put it, like... The, you, you can have that right now. Sign this contract right now. Sign this contract and this is yours. Yep, it is. And, and what they find is when they actually hold that physical check, that it is hard to actually give it back because they really need the money. Yep. So I, I think that's a good one. I mean, make sure and bring your contract and... Have a checkbook with you. I agree. I agree. So walk the property with the owner. And ask, ask a lot questions. of questions. A lot, really and truly, there is a reason why most realtors say, like whenever there's inspections or there's uh, people looking at the house and I have the house listed, I want that homeowner gone. <laughs> I do not want them on the premise whatsoever because I do not want them talking to any of the buyers. Because they're going to end up telling the buyer something that I am going to have to argue later, <laughs> you know, or I'm going to have to battle because they're trying to get the price of the house down or they're trying to, you know, negotiate something. And well, the seller said, blah, 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 blah. No, I do not want the seller talking, which is exactly why as a wholesaler, you want to talk to the owner and you want to hear all about it. Tell me your stories. <laughs> Tell me about when you fell through the, the ceiling and you couldn't patch that right. Well, and you always do want to just point stuff out. Yeah. And you don't have to do it in a mean way. It's just a matter of fact. Oh, what happened here? That's all you need to say. And then let them talk. Yep. Yeah. You just need to let them, the talk. homeowner, talk. Um, and then let the homeowner know about the rehab. Yeah. And going, you know, you can run really fast numbers, which I'm sure your numbers talking to the homeowner are going to be more. You know, yeah, you're not 100% sure on your numbers, but this is, this is going to cost some money to rehab. You're not telling that owner anything that they don't already know. Well, there's a reason why they called you. <laughs> there's a reason why they decided that that was the best avenue is to call off that sign or off that postcard is because they know there's a lot wrong with the house that they can't. They can't do on their own. They, they are in over their head. Or they don't want to. Or that. And so you're not telling them anything. Right. I mean, you have no idea what that homeowner's situation is. It could be that they are you may be behind on their mortgage. You're not sure. Um, they could be having problems with their spouse. Maybe they're getting divorced. They could, you know, be sick. 
you know, maybe their kids are driving them crazy. It's just, there's so many reasons why they can't deal with that home and yeah, everything and going they on. they need it, time, right. time to move on. So, and then the third, when you're making the offer, I, when I go in and, and this is, by the way, this is with anything, right? With anything that you're negotiating, think about what the outcome you want is. And then make offers that are going to give them choices. So like I give them an all cash option mm -hmm. and then I give them a taking over payments option, you know, a, a pseudo owner finance, if you will. If there's enough equity, then absolutely. But it's the same thing that we were talking about on an episode before, which is basically you have some exit strategies, have have Possible. some choice. Yeah. Because you're looking at that property and you're going, okay, I may want to keep it, but I might just sell it. I might just sell it and I don't have to touch it. And all I got to do is clean out all this hoarder stuff. And that's a quick, you know, $30,000 that I can do on this property and move on to the next that maybe isn't as much work. So have a couple of different exit strategies for yourself, but also that homeowner it would behoove you to have several different exit strategies for them as well. Right, and and just you know, wholesalers out there thinking, oh, I can only get a cash offer. You can sell somebody to take over payments and get somebody Absolutely. to pay you cash All day. for that. All day. All day. I mean, people want that, and so if you can just go, hey, we'll take over your, we'll take over your your mortgage. Um, how much cash do you want for that? homeowner gets a little cash and you negotiate your assignment fee and just take it over which is uh, that that's a well sought after right solution. and i think it's going to be a huge solution well yeah because going then, forward a lot of times what ends up happening and what's so appealing right now is as interest rates keep going up that that payment or that note that they're going to take over that investor wants to take over that's going to most likely be at a lower interest rate than what they could purchase the home. Two or three percent. I mean, if you could get two or three percent, I mean, you're not going to go refinance that. Yeah. Why There's, would you? Right. Yeah. So I, I love it. Um, and then finding your end buyer. Who's, who's your investor that's going to buy this thing from you, right? Well, and I hear this all the time whenever I'm talking to new investors and new realtors. They're like, well, how do I find a buyer? You know, if I came across this deal, what am I going to do with it then? I can't buy the property. I'm putting it under contract, but I, I don't have $150,000, $200,000 in the bank. And I'm like, you're not supposed to. You're doing an assignment and now you're going out. Well, I don't have that. You have people that you know and you network and drop into some of the, so it's never been easier in my mind. <laughs> to it's find, just, does somebody find somebody looking for a good real estate deal? Yeah, it's never been easier. I mean, it used to, you actually had to build a buyer's list. But even if you're, I mean, well, and I, and again, yeah, we keep saying the market, market is softening, but it's not softening that much. No. You could just relist this. You, and that's called wholetailing. Yep. I mean, you don't even have to find, you know, keep it off the market. If you wanted, you put it under contract and then you just list it on MLS. And see if you can't get a retail buyer. But the, as far as finding somebody on, as, fi as far as finding other buyers that are investor buyers, like dropping into your local wholesaling, <laughs> like you, you just search I, it on Facebook. I sold... That's right. I sold four on Facebook this year, four this yep. year. I didn't even do it on Facebook Marketplace. Mm -mm. No, I went in just to a real estate investment group. I said, this is what I've got here. Are the photos. In another state. Yeah. And we're talking, yeah, I'm in all the time. I, I think the longest it took me, shortest was less than 30 minutes, 28 minutes to get, to get zelled, to get zelled the, the non-refundable deposit wow. and to have a signed contract 28 minutes wow. after putting it on Facebook. Um, longest I think was like two or three hours. And I had like a cashier's check brought to me the next day. Nice. But that was, I mean, and that's, and that sight unseen. Now, granted, she's a season, we, you know, we're not suggesting you go out and do this. No, but she's a seasoned investor and she got these notes that were out of state that she was not going to deal with, so. <laughs> right. 
Still, I easy mean, solution. It's an easy solution. So Facebook right now, I would say, is my go-to to sell almost anything. I mean, agreed. Not so much mortgage notes. I mean, that one's a different thing. But if you're looking to sell a piece of real estate, I don't care where that thing is located, you can do it on Facebook, and you don't have to be in marketplace. Yep. You can just do it wherever. Um, same thing with finding them, bandit signs. Um, that I find works for owner finance really, really well. Yes. Well, I mean, also the same as, you know, if you're in a well sought after neighborhood for rentals, then they just stick the rental sign for rent. Um, it's the same way with owner finance. People don't know exactly where to find those and they're just driving around. Well, and well, as far as, yeah, if you're selling owner finance or it's also a great place to find investors. I love to put my bandit signs at the exits of Home Depot and Lowe's. Nice. Because you've got real estate investors and you've got contractors. That's who's there. So if you've got a wholesale deal, you can probably sell it, I would say, in a day, maybe two, if you just put bandit signs on the exits of Home Depot and Lowe's. Early in the morning. Early in the morning. <laughs> when they can't see you. Or, or late after the <laughs> manager's like, yeah, gone yeah, home. Or that, care. after they close. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, hitting the days. You yeah. know, when do, you know, you're going to have more real estate investors there on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got contractors there all during all the, the time. week. And, you know, I get a lot of my leads. I've bought properties from leads from my contractors. Because they're like, oh, do you want another property? I was talking to this person. He's got this for sale, you know, and they pick up a few bucks. So they're happy with that. Well, and the other tip that we've talked about before is um, requiring option money, yes. not earnest money. Very important. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the difference is, option money is the money that you as the seller get no matter what. If they walk away from the deal, you get to keep it and you don't have to refund it. And if they stay in the deal, they get it at closing. But you want to be able to hang on to something. You want them to have some skin in the game. And so you want that option fee to be more significant. If I'm dealing with an investment real estate property, I never, and I'm the seller, I never take earnest money. It's a waste of time. I take option money. Yeah, well, because as a seller... Zero for earnest. Yeah, as a seller, the earnest money doesn't usually end up happening. You know, I mean that they end up backing out of the contract within their period of time that they can and they get their earnest money back. So that doesn't do and let's say that, that doesn't they, do me any good. Let's say that they I've had an investor buyer from me hold up my sale because they refused to relinquish the earnest money. Even mm -hmm. though it was it was mine contractually, they can still get that earnest money back. Because all I have to do is not sign the sheet saying that I agree to give this yep. to the seller. And then the only way you can sell it going and go forward, even if you get another buyer, is, is to then to get, give them get their rid of money back. So I find it a waste of time to take yeah, it. Yeah, nine times out of ten, you're, whether, they, whether the buyer was in default or not, uh, the buyer's going to get that earnest money back. Yeah. Even if they're in default. So option money, non-refundable deposits or non-refundable options. Take a thousand. I'm seeing five thousand. Although I'm sure they probably didn't put that much option money down. They might have put five hundred bucks, but then they're going to charge those wholesalers are charging five thousand dollars non-refundable deposit. Yeah. So if you get in there and you buy that, and then you decide you don't want to buy it, you lose You're your out. five thousand. Yeah. Which. You know, I don't, I don't think that that's, that that's not unreasonable. It's pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, last one, where do you close? You cannot just go close anywhere. No, not with a wholesale or an assignment. You have to know, you have to be in with some title companies. This isn't just like whenever you're talking about getting hard money loans or anything like that. There are certain mortgagers out there, mortgage, mortgagers, uh, that will do those type of loans. And then you've got your big box loans. You've got, you know, your lending tree that you got to fit in this little bitty box. And they're only going to give you money if you fit in that box. Same thing goes for title companies. Most title companies are very, very strict and they only do things that fit in their tiny little box and they don't like to do anything outside of it. And this is considered more of a creative deal. Right. Um, 
And then we have to get down to the difference between an assignment fee and a double close. And your title company needs to be willing to do a double close, first of all. Um, and that'll be an investor-friendly one. Here's the difference. If it's an assignment of contract, you don't have to pay the entire purchase price for that piece of property. But what you're going to make on that deal is going to show up on the HUD ones. So just be aware of that. If you are going to do a double close, you actually get two HUD ones. You get one for when you buy it and you get one for when you sell it. So the seller and the buyer have no idea how much money you're making when you do a double close. Yeah. What, what's your rule there? What do you, what do you see? I, coming from the investor side, me personally, I don't care. I really don't. And a lot of people say that, but they get a little yeah, yeah, they upset. Say that, but, uh, you know, I have seen several people definitely, uh, definitely get upset about what the wholesaler All makes. of a sudden they get to the HUD-1 and that wholesaler's got a seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 assignment that they've made. I've seen them to where it was a $300,000 assignment. Did you really? $300,000 assignment and it's a commercial building. That was on one of Daniel's deals. And he wasn't mad about it. He's like, I thought the price was good. He was like, kind of good on you. And he was like, I wish I would have known that beforehand. Right. But, I mean, you know, kind of good on you. Uh, but it's one of those things of you don't know how they're going to react. And if you don't feel the need to let them know that or along the way you've decided, all right, this personality is probably going to kind of twist off at the moment that they figure out how much I'm making on this deal, then you really might want to look into the double close. Because you really do want to build this business. And if you piss a bunch of people off yeah, and everybody finds out what you made, you know, it, it's, I don't know. I always said anything more than, and again, this has changed now, yep. but I always said anything more than 10. Then make it a double close. Make it a double close. I don't have any hard and fast I rules. Either. I don't do enough of them, but I would say um, I, I personally wouldn't want somebody to know. And, and there, is, there is a cost of money to doing a double close, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't do. But if you're going to go make 50 grand on an assignment, freaking pay your 1%. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Big deal. It is. It's a 1% fee. There's tons of hard money lenders out there who will do it for you. I think basically all the big shops do it. Yep. And they do double close money where they are going to get that money to a title company. So it's sitting there, you know, waiting, waiting. It's there for a day. Hard money lenders make their point. And yep. then you get to take away your big assignment fee and nobody knows about it. Yeah. So. Well, I think that about covers it on our little basics. list of basics of the wholesaling. So if you have got any questions or you want to share one of your experiences or do you prefer the double close or the assignment, <laughs> tell us why. You know, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then we also have it out there on as a podcast now. We do have... Uh, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. We have a TikTok? Yeah. So, I don't know how to work that. <laughs> we're, we're doing that. We're doing that. So anyway, be sure to uh, follow us and give us some feedback. Tell us what you'd like to hear about. I'm Jay Lee Thompson with Texel Real Estate and Real Estate Reformation. And I'm Kristen Gerst with Capricorn Mortgage Investments. Bye.